Well, welcome to worship. We have a skeleton crew here at Christ the King, but we hopefully have some folks joining us online or viewing this uh, later on uh, as a worship practice during this time of uh, quarantine and social distancing uh, as we try to keep this coronavirus from spreading. We uh, continue to, uh, to minister and to worship God here at Christ the King. And so if you are uh, tuning in at home, uh, welcome. And there will be uh, some time to, to sing and, and to, uh, to join us um, and to worship together. But we look forward to hearing uh, and continuing our theme throughout Lent uh, of hearing authentic stories this morning. And so our own Allie Starks will be sharing her own story about, uh, about uh, the ways that, uh, that reputation has impacted her life. Uh, bear with us as this is all new regarding the technology and streaming and all that. Uh, so there might be some bumps along the way, but we will continue uh, in our worship of God. But now let us join together, and I just invite you to take a moment, take a breath, prepare your heart and your mind to worship God. And we'll begin with a call to worship. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully known. You know where I've been, and you know where I'll be. I cannot escape you. If I walk among the stars or sleep in the deepest caverns of the earth, you are there. Your hand is upon me, even now. Your eyes beheld me when I was yet unformed. It was you who crafted me in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your thoughts and plans, they overwhelm me. Yet even at the end of eternity, I am still with you. Drive out all wickedness, maliciousness, evil, and hatred. Drive it out from me and lead me in the ancient way the narrow and the difficult way that leads to life. I want to invite Allie to come forward and begin with her story. Now is a time when we bring our own stories before God. Reputations are man-made. As a high schooler, I know too much about them. They can make or break your experience, and trying to shake one off, good luck. I've had many reputations throughout my life, and to explain them all in detail would be validating their power and therefore act as an injustice to the person I truly am today. But in all honesty, they haven't all been the greatest. I admit some have been based on poor decisions and some based on rumors, but nevertheless, their weight has been overwhelming. I've been called out on social media, confronted in person, cut off by some around me based on the identity that others had given me. What I would have given for them to listen to my side, to listen to how, yes, I've had shortcomings, but society mi mislabeled me this time, I swear. I wasn't my reputation, at least not anymore. It's been like this my whole life. I climb a mountain only to find out there's more ahead. I finally win a battle against my reputations only to find out that I have more to uncover, more to apologize for, more to make amends from. There were times when I considered just giving up. I would become a lone ranger because, after all, I was the only one who really knew me. I was the only one who had my back at the end of the day, not even God. Society labeled me, and God doesn't like bad reps, right? I thought I was the woman at the well. Why should Jesus talk to me? I didn't deserve the living water. Ask the people who blocked me on Instagram if they think I deserve to drink from the hands of God. Seems childish, but that's what it sounds like to listen to the reputations that are given to you and the people around you. I know my truth, and it doesn't change because others don't. Please join me to pray the unison prayer of confession. God of grace, God of grace our, reputations our reputations have never, never swayed, swayed you. From 
but, but we, but we confess, confess that, that we sometimes confine ourselves or others by them. We, we confess, confess that it is sometimes easier or more comfortable to make judgments about others, to limit our ability to see others fully. We, we confess that we sometimes put in too much effort to avoid or to fit into a specific reputation. We confess that when we do, we lose sight of our true, unshakable identity as your beloved child. Forgive us. Forgive our misplaced trust in anything other than your love and grace. Make us to boldly stand in our sacred identity as your beloved. Reputations, trying to fit people in neat little boxes, just aren't Christian. God has a sole power of judgment, yet somehow we still find ourselves making assumptions about our brothers and sisters. I've changed how I viewed those around me, seeing others as their one true identity, a child of God. At times, the voices of society drown out the voice of God, and it seems easier to accept reputations as truth. That's simply not his voice. His voice tells me to shed his mercy, to be a manifestation of his grace. Forgiving those around me has brought me closure. Did it end the malice of reputation? It may have helped, but slowly and surely, I'm mending my most important reputation, mine with God. I yearn to be his walking grace, his justice, his peace, his resilience. I yearn to hear his voice, to know others first by their true identity, a child of God, to not make assumptions, to have a reputation of love. We give thanks to God for his enduring grace as we sing our gathering hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, ELW number 742.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Merciful, Merciful God, God, the fountain of living water, you quench our thirst and wash away our sin. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows with the beauty of your truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll continue with our gospel reading, and I invite you to stand. Today, this is the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. O Lord. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jacob, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and it is here now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came, they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, and so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. 
For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you do not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you may be seated. Hmm. So as we live in the time of the coronavirus, we are all doing the best that we can to curb our anxiety, to stay positive, and to figure out what it looks like to go on with life in this new reality. All these things, however, are really hard as the places we frequent, work, church, and perhaps at some point school, begin to close for the sake of social distancing. We, too, end up having to change. We have to adapt. We have to come up with new plans and new strategies. It's fitting, I believe, that here at Christ the King, we're remembering that God is present with us even in the difficult stories of our lives when things don't go well or when things aren't going well. And that means that God is present with us during worldwide pandemics, too. As we look to our gospel lesson for today, we can glean many things about what the good news might be for us in this time. So here are a few of my ideas. First, this gospel passage reminds us that change and adapting to change has always been a part of following Jesus. Jesus was changing things up all the time. He was surprising the disciples at every turn with his teachings and with his action. His conversation with the Samaritan woman is a great example. It is widely agreed among scholars and teachers that the Samaritan woman in our story is an outsider, someone whom Jesus should not have spoken to, not only because she was a Samaritan and Jews weren't to associate with Samaritans, and not only because she comes to the well at noon rather than in the morning when most others would have come to get water for the day, but also because she was a woman. Interactions between men and women were largely inappropriate at this time, outside the bounds of marriage or family, and this was especially true for religious people. Barbara Brown Taylor, in an article from the Christian Century, tells us that there was even a group of holy men who at this time were known as the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because they closed their eyes if they saw a woman while walking down the street, and they often ran into walls. Many have come to the conclusion that she is also an outsider because of her apparent promiscuity. Therefore, scholars and pastors have spent a lot of time and energy trying to explain why this woman is not being shamed by Jesus when he calls her out for having five husbands. Many scholars explain this by sharing about one system of marriage at the time where, upon the death of your husband, she would become the wife of his brother or other male family members because being married is her only hope of having any resources to live. If this is the case, then this would have happened to her five times. So rather than being promiscuous, her background is likely the result of a lot of grief, a lot of upheaval, and a lot of difficult, difficult life circumstances. I also learned this week, however, that when Jesus mentions her five husbands, he might actually be talking about the Samaritan history with worshiping other gods, rather than with the woman's personal life. Husband was a term that the prophets Hosea and Jeremiah both used as they proclaimed prophecies warning against worshiping other gods. The woman Jesus encounters at the well 
would only have known what Jesus meant by this if she was theologically astute, if she had been paying attention to the message of the prophets of the past. After Jesus talks this way, she then knows he is a prophet, which makes me wonder if perhaps the reputation that ostracizes her is that she is smart, theologically minded, and a woman who doesn't keep quiet like she's supposed to. Perhaps it is her intelligence and her unwillingness to hide it in a time when women were not welcomed into theological dialogue or to lead in any form, for that matter, that makes her an outsider. Jesus challenges all these social norms when he sees her as she is, and invites her to lead in his mission of sharing the good news of God's love and grace. He sees the way that she has been belittled and dismissed, how being loud has gained her a reputation, and preaches the good news to her and her whole community by allowing her to use her brilliant mind and capacities for ministry within her community. I'm guessing her newfound leadership changed everything, not only for herself, but for all in her community. I wouldn't be surprised if they all then wondered what it looked like to be faithful people now. Now that Jesus invited them, people with whom Jews were supposed to practice social distancing, to be a part of his religious movement. Now that that woman has been invited to lead within it, Likely, both the Samaritans and the disciples had to change. They had to adapt. They had to make a new plan because ministry was going to look very different. The second thing that I think we can lean from this good news, the good news in this gospel passage, is that Jesus teaches it doesn't matter where we worship. When the woman asked Jesus about the long-held argument between the Jews and the Samaritans about the correct place to worship, Jesus teaches that it's not about where we worship. He says we worship in spirit and truth, not on a specific mountain or, therefore, in a specific building. We need not go to church to worship. We can worship anywhere, even via Facebook Live. Third, in removing the need to worship in a specific physical place, we are freed to recognize that the building is not the church, but that we, the people, are the church. And in this crazy time, we have an opportunity to think about what it means and looks like in whole new ways. I've seen so many ways that churches and sec church communities and secular communities are showing up for each other, even though we can't do so physically. My new mom's group has been emailing each other, offering to meet up for walks, to help with childcare or other necessities, and for sharing resources if and when it's needed. My next door neighbors offered, texted us offering to let us raid their bookshelf. And I'm not talking about my neighbor who is the library. And some of you I have seen offer to run errands for elderly members of our congregation or neighbors that you know or to provide meals for kiddos if they don't have school and food insecurity is real for their family. And don't forget that we can call, we can email, we can write letters, or we can video chat with loved ones near and far. Social distancing, Nat was telling me, should actually be called physical distancing because we can still be social with one another. We can still care for one another, and we can still be the church for one another and for our community. Finally, and most importantly, this gospel passage reminds us that Jesus is, and Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well reminds us in this time of hoarding toilet paper and canned goods that the one thing that we will never, that will never ever change is the promise of the living water. We survive on that spring of water that promise that gushes through our lives, and we can trust it no matter what comes our way. As Philip Yancey says, like water flows downward. No matter how low we sink, 
grace flows to that lowest point. Whether during a worldwide pandemic or on your average Sunday in March, the promise of God rings in and through our lives. We survive not only on the basic necessities that we may or may not have stocked up on in order to stay out of the public, but through the promise of God that will never change. The good news for us in this ancient, anxious time is that God lifts up leaders in all kinds of ways, even leaders that we wouldn't expect, even leaders who might have a reputation. God lifts up even us. So I pray you may be able to take some time to take a deep breath, to find some stillness and to connect with God in the midst of this crazy time in which we live. May you be reminded that God lifts up leaders in all kinds of ways, even leaders we wouldn't expect, even leaders who have a reputation. May you know that God lifts up even us. Thanks be to God. Amen. We'll sing together our hymn of the day. I heard the voice of Jesus say, which is number 611. Let us confess together the story of the faith that we share, speaking the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator, creator of, of heaven, heaven and, and earth. earth. I, believe I believe in, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was, who was conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us join together in a time of prayer. And if you are joining us online, I, I invite you to, to pray with us now. Uh, and if you have a specific prayer concern uh, that you would like to lift up, to post that in the comments of uh, either our Facebook page or uh, of the video that's posted uh, later on. Uh, and if you have a specific prayer need uh, during this time of uh, so social distancing and restrictions, uh, then please call the church office and let us know. But let us pray together. Holy God, we lift our hearts to you. We lift them up in prayer. We ask that you would be with us as we worship, that you would build the bonds of community even across great distance, that you would open our hearts to generosity, to kindness, to love. We ask you to be in the lives of all those who are lonely and feeling even more separated from one another during this time. We ask your prayers to be on those who are afraid uh, who are fearful during this time of increased anxiety. We ask you to be with us as a church as we seek to continue to lift up your message of love and care and life abundant. Christ, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Holy God, we lift up prayers for those who are sick or in need, in any sort of need at this time. We lift up prayers especially for Lori and Lois, for Steve and for Jim, for Ginny and Christine, for Jaden and Pastor Dave and Shar. We pray for Miriam and Jim, Stacy and Wayne and Dan, John and Helen and Marianne, Janet, and Laura, Marlo, and Sultan. We lift up all of those people that are dealing with illness those that are diagnosed with coronavirus around the world, and those afraid of it. Christ, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. God, this morning, Governor Walls announced plans to close Minnesota's public schools from kindergarten through 12th grade, starting this Wednesday and going until March 27th. We pray for the families of all those who have school-aged children, for all those who need to make arrangements, for all the kids uh, that will be uh, far from one another. And we ask you to be with our entire community in this time, to reach out for meals where uh, food is in short supply, to reach out with love and care via phone calls or uh, being outdoors together. God, be with us. Be with our children and families. Christ, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God, we pray for our leaders, for our, the governments of Minnesota, of Bloomington, of the United States, of leaders around the world. As it's inspire in them a goodwill a willingness to work together to, uh, to face the problems of our world together. Not just this present pandemic, but all the problems of the world. Problems like climate change, problems like income inequality, and desperate poverty, problems like fear and hate of difference. And help us to build a common human community, a community of love, 
community that we see promised in your kingdom. Christ, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And O oh God of justice, God of love, we give you thanks that through you we have light. Light to illumine our way through life. Light from the words of your Son, Jesus. Give us the light that we need now. Awaken us to the needs of others. And at the end, bring all the world to your fantastic and heavenly feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory to ever, forever. We lift these prayers up to you. Amen. Amen. Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray as we ought to pray. Our Father, our Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we close our worship this morning, we want to uh, just make sure that uh, we're keeping everyone up to date. So we are uh, closing our, our big activities for the next few weeks, um, at least for the next two weeks, and we'll reassess during that time and keep uh, announcements about, uh, about how we will uh, manage as the situation progresses and changes. So keep posted, or keep, stay tuned for that. Um, we are uh, hoping to be able to stream our worship services uh, next Sunday and in also this Wednesday at 6 o'clock uh, for our Lenten worship service, to stream that on Facebook and to have a video available on our website at some time. Um, I understand that our website is down this morning, uh, which is probably due to increased traffic of church websites and the church website hosting service that we have. Um, so, uh, so just bear with us all as all the churches are trying to figure out how to worship and how to be community together. Um, and then I also got a note that while we've been in worship today, uh, as I mentioned in our prayers, that Governor Walls had announced plans to close uh, all of Minnesota's public K-12 through schools uh, starting this Wednesday and going until Friday, uh, March 27th, in order to combat COVID-19 or the coronavirus uh, spread. So uh, I guess, Allie, congratulations. You don't have to go to school. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Pastor Maria, is there anything you want to? Just a reminder that if you, um, you have needs or you would like support, um, Pastor Roy and I are happy to make phone calls to anyone who um, is lonely or um, concerned. We are happy to pray over the phone. Um, and to, we hopefully can help provide any needs that come up. Um, we, we will be, we are not taking off of work, um, is what I'm trying to say. That we are here, we are still your pastors in this time, and um, so hopefully you will be receiving not only worship services, but potentially some devotional materials and um, ways to stay connected with one another during this time, and to remind you to um, if you, if there are people that you regularly check in with and visit anyway, keep calling them, check in with them, um, call the people who um, you are close to in your circles, and um, just stay in touch with one another. We don't need to be isolated during this time. Yes. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, we will uh, move forward as best we can, uh, continuing to be community of, uh, community of God's uh, people and of love. But with that, let us uh, close our worship with a word of blessing and invite you to stand to receive that blessing. You cannot hide from God's love. 
You cannot undo God's gift of grace. Go now into the world with the blessing of God, the author of your story, with Jesus who walks with you, and of the Holy Spirit who guides your story's path. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and share the good news. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God.